day to gather and worship the Lord. Glad that you're all here today as we uh, continue our our worship series, Faith Matters, and we'll be talking about prayer today. Prayer matters today and every day. And so we're going to open with prayer, and I'll invite you to pray along with me if you have your worship guide handy. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another. By uh, those of you who are on the lawn, you can wave and uh, uh, share the peace of Christ with one another. You can uh, honk your horns if you're in the cars so people online can hear you. And if you're worshiping online, uh, text someone, call someone, email someone. You can go ahead and uh, uh, text in and, uh, and be able to, uh, um, you can even type in here in the uh in the worship, in the live worship. So um, I wish the peace of Christ to be with you. And I'm going to encourage any kids to uh, to jump on to the, uh, to the recording here if you're watching online. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about a, a prayer that um, a prayer that uh, that I have learned in the past. And I, I've taught some of you this before, but I thought this would be a good week to go over it once again, and it is called a five-finger prayer, five-finger prayer. And we have five fingers, and uh, and so it's a way that we can remember who and what to pray for if we just look at our hands and do the five-finger prayer. So the first is that we pray with our thumb for people who are closest to us, right? Because our thumb is close to us. So Pray for those who are close to you and your family. So let's take a minute to pray for people who are close to you, family and close friends. Think of those people. God, we pray for these people who are close to us. We pray for our family. And we thank you for those who love us so dearly. Okay, so the second finger that we're going to use to pray for is our pointer finger. These are people who point you in the right direction. So teachers, your teachers need prayer right now as the as the new school year continues. Uh, people who point you or direct you towards God. So perhaps me, your pastor, or perhaps uh, other people in the church who you, um, who you can think of. People who teach Sunday school People who have people like Miss Doris who have helped play the bells with you, helped you guys play the bells. Um, people who point you in the right direction and give you wisdom and guidance. That's what we'll pray for. So think of those people and pray for them. We thank you, God, for our teachers. We thank you, God, for pastors. We thank you, God, for spiritual leaders, for, for Sunday school teachers, for those who teach us to play the children's bells, for those who act as confirmation mentors. We thank you for the ways that they point us in the right direction. Now, the third of our five finger prayers uh, is the, um, the our middle finger, which is the tallest finger. See, it's the highest finger. So we think about those who lead, people who who lead, perhaps lead our government, people like both locally and uh, in our country, people who lead in our school. So maybe the principal. Uh, people who lead in other ways, people who lead, um, you know, different places that we go. So let's pray for leaders, people who lead in our community and in our world. God, leading others is a difficult job. Whether it's at school as a principal or, 
or in our local community or in our country or in our world. So we pray for those leaders that you would be with them, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them courage, that you would give them compassion, that you would give them strength to do what they need to do. Okay, so we're almost done with how many fingers have we used? One, two, three. So fourth finger, our ring finger. See, I have a ring on mine. So our fourth finger is our ring finger. And you know, it's the weakest finger. It has the, the, the weakest muscles. It, it, um, so it's one that we can use to remind ourselves to pray for those who are weak or sick or hurting or those who need healing. Okay, so let's, let's pray for, can you think of someone who maybe needs healing or someone who's sad today or someone who's hurting? God, not everybody is healthy today. Not everybody's happy. Some people are in need of healing. Other people, Lord, are in need of your strength because they don't have much of their own strength anymore. And so we pray for them and all those around them. Okay, so we have four of our five fingers have been used. So what is the last finger, our, our pinky finger? What are we gonna use our pinky finger to pray for? Who have we not prayed for yet? All the people, who have we not prayed for yet? Well, today we have prayed for everybody except for ourselves, right? So your pinky finger is a reminder to pray for yourself. So let's Let's take a minute and I'll just let you, each of you silently pray for yourselves and then I will close us in prayer. So, so think about what you want from God. What is it today that God could help you with? Pray for yourself. God, I thank you for all these people that we have prayed for today. The people closest to us, the people who point us in the right direction, the people who lead us, the people who are weak or hurting, and, and even all these children. I give you thanks for the ways that they are a blessing in my life and for the ways that you are with them as you are with us in this worship moment. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
pray for you. Our thoughts and prayers are with those affected, we say. Or we ask, how's your prayer life? Or, well, have you prayed about that? Uh, during meetings, sometimes I say, whose turn is it to pray? I hear some people say prayer works. Prayer is something that we talk about a lot. It's a word that's very casually thrown around, but what is prayer? I mean, how do we define it? How do we do it? And what does prayer do? Now, you may or may not be familiar with the concept and the practice of prayer as a Christian practice. Well, quite simply, prayer is a conversation with God. Prayer is not talking to God or about God. Prayer is talking with God, which means that it's a conversation, which means that we both speak and we listen with God. And like conversation, it can take many forms. Sometimes our prayers and our prayer time is very, very short, and other times it is so long and engaging that we lose all track of time. Prayer can be private, just between us and God, or it can be in a group of which God is a part, and it can take place anywhere. There's not only something we can do in a church sanctuary, nor is it something that can be banned from places like schools, as some people like to suggest. We get to speak with God anywhere and any time and in any way. And in fact, prayer isn't even a practice that's limited to Christianity. Speaking with the divine is found in some form in all major religions. But Jesus did promote prayer with his followers. And this is what he says about prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. When you pray, he says, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them, because your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this, our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for the day today. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Let us pray. The Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Amen. Okay, so as we dive into prayer today, we're going to look at two questions. One is, why? Why do we even pray? What's the point of prayer? Why should we do it? And then second, how should we pray? If we determine that we should, then how do we do it? So first, why do we pray? Why should we? What's the point of prayer? Well, it's an interesting question, and it's a common question that I've, I've had uh, asked of me many times, and it's a question I've always had a hard time answering because I guess the answer depends on what you want prayer to do for you. Why do we pray? Well, I guess a good thing to ask is what is our out intended outcome of prayer? What are we trying to do with it? Now, I am by nature the kind of person that's a bit of a problem solver and a results oriented person. And so I always want to determine the intended outcome and then develop a plan to work towards it very uh, clearly and, and strategically. And what this means is that when I pray, I often approach it as solving problems by strategically getting towards the solution. And so I, I, I look at prayer and I think, hey, God, can you can you heal this person? and show us what decision to make and provide what we need to move forward and to do it quickly. And God, can you give me the following things, wisdom and courage and strength. And you know, God, while you're at it, I'll tell you what could be fixed is, you know, all of 2020. It's been pretty awful, Lord, if you haven't noticed. So if you could just fix it, that would be great. And look, God is powerful enough to do each one of those things that I, that I would ask. 
but that doesn't mean it's always going to happen. Sometimes when I pray for people to get better, they do. They, they get better, they, they recover, they heal. But you know, sometimes I pray for people to get better and they don't. Sometimes as soon as I ask God to provide me with something, God provides just what I need. Other times I have to wait a long time before things work out. And then there are times when what I ask for doesn't work out, doesn't happen. The prayer goes unanswered. Trust me, if prayer alone could fix this broken world, it would be fixed already because people have been praying for centuries for God to heal our broken world, and it hasn't yet fully worked. We can say that God will fix everything. We can say that God will give us all the tools and resources we ask for and answer our prayers in just the way we want God to do that. But our lived experience makes it clear to us that it isn't always the case. Even despite our best efforts at prayer, people die, bad things still happen, and there are moments when we don't know the solution to the problem and we don't know how to respond to something. We don't know what to do and no amount of prayer will change these facts of life. So I know I haven't quite given a good uh, argument for praying yet because it seems if, if prayer doesn't always get answered by God, what purpose would it serve? Is there a point to praying if we don't get the results that we're looking for, or the intended outcome, or if prayer doesn't always uplift our spirits or make us feel good, why would we even pray to a God who refuses to solve all of our problems? Why would we do that? Well, here's why, because that's not the goal of prayer. The goal of prayer is not to, to get our problems all solved. It's not to give God a honeydew list of chores for our week. God, can you fix the leaky toilet and clean out the garage and install the new ceiling fan? The purpose of prayer is not to avoid problems, and it's not to solve the problems so that we no longer have to deal with anything bad. Prayer is not about any of that. Rather, prayer is meant to center us in God's spirit so that we can face the problems and the challenges that we have, and with God's strength through prayer, we can weather those challenges for as long as they last. That centering in the spirit of God is twofold. First, it is, it is what many people would call today uh, a way of mindfulness and meditation. These are words that are used even by people who are not Christian, who, who, who understand the need to pause throughout the day, to quiet our mind, to breathe deeply, and to become more aware, what is it that I'm thinking and feeling in this moment, and what is the bigger picture? There are many ways and many tools uh, to, to do this. Mindfulness and meditation is, is such a, a popular thing today. Uh, there are apps on your phone to do that. In fact, one of the ones that I love to use is the My Life app. It, it used to be called Stop, Breathe, and Think, which, again, is, is a perfect way of describing prayer. Stop, breathe, and think, or stop, breathe, and pray. Now, now this My Life app is, and many of the mindfulness and meditation apps are not Christian-based meditations, but to me, I can use it as a form of Christian prayer. It, it can help me to become mindful of my own thoughts and feelings, and then I can release those thoughts and feelings, in my case as a Christian, releasing them not into nothingness, but release them into the hands of the divine, into the hands of God. I can even turn this popular practice that's not a Christian practice into a Christian prayer practice. But, you know, prayer is, is not just about getting in touch with ourselves. It is partially centering ourselves and reminding ourselves of what really matters and, and, and making us more aware of what we're thinking and feeling. But prayer isn't just to serve ourselves. It also is a way of looking beyond ourselves. As writer Andrew Root describes, prayer is the broadening of our attention. It is the broadening of our attention, he says, on the world around us, looking for the arrival of God who announces God's self by speaking to us and calling us to pray for others, 
in and through the actions of ministry, prayer, he says, is our most trusted way to step back, turning attention away from other observations to seek the action of God in and through ministry. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a time of stopping and breathing and thinking beyond ourselves and turning our attention away from, from the things that are going on, all the noise around us and turning our attention towards the God who is at work in the midst. Now, some skeptics of prayer often ask me what the point of prayer is. Do we really think we can control God if we ask God to heal someone or end suffering in the world or protect us from the coronavirus that God's going to do it? Is prayer some kind of magical incantation to control the world around us? Well, what if we looked at it less as that and more as what Andrew Root says, something that allows us to step back? if prayer helps us to give control up instead of trying to control God with it? What if it allows us to trust in God more deeply the more that we pray and helps us to be more aware of the activity of God that's already taking place in the world? So let's use this example, this recent example with these wildfires raging in the West. And I pray for people in those situations in harm's way. And I pray for the firefighters who are fighting the blaze. And when I do that, I have no illusion that God is sitting around just waiting for, for me to pray. And as soon as I utter my prayer, God swoops in to intervene, to put out the fires and to protect the firefighters and those in harm's way. But I, I don't think that God's just waiting for me to ask God to do that in order to intervene divinely. But here's what does happen. As I pray, I begin to recognize that there is suffering outside of myself. And I begin to notice the activity that God is already doing. I, I begin to notice that, that God is already working through people who risk their lives to save fellow humans, which is an inspiring sacrificial act in the way of Jesus. I'm reminded as I pray that possessions can always be replaced, but people can't. By the act of praying, I stay attentive to the continued destruction of God's beautifully created world. And, and then I start to wonder as I continue to pray how much we have a part in that. And if we do have a part in this changing climate, then, then have we abandoned our call that God has given us to be stewards of this creation? Maybe God's activity through my prayers includes causing me to wake up to the devastation that might have been happening anyway, but that is being made worse instead of better because of our own actions. That's just one of the things that I've heard from God in some of my prayers this week, as God has, has helped me to evaluate my role in suffering. Prayer is the action of pausing and stepping back and drawing more attentively into God's activity, which is already occurring, from the ways that humans depend on one another to survive, to showing us where we go wrong in caring for creation, to seeing hope for a future where our desires take a back seat to God's will. So if after all that, you are open to prayer and you still don't know how to pray, let's talk about it. How do we pray? How should we pray? In all my years of being a pastor, I have learned a really, really simple trick that can make a room full of chatty, outgoing Christians all go silent and suddenly become interested in their shoes. All I have to do is say, who is willing to pray for us today? It can make a room full of even the most devoted Christians go silent. And so if you're at a loss for words and you don't know how to pray, guess what? You are far from the only one. Generally speaking, most American Christians are not comfortable with public prayer. I think part of that is because we pray in private far less frequently, frequently than we wish to admit. I also believe that we now have two to three generations of adults who were never actually taught to pray. They were taught that they should pray, but not taught how to pray as children. 
And I can only hope that with the children of today, we don't make the same mistake. And we teach them not only that they should pray, but we teach them how to pray at the dinner table, at bedtime, in Christian worship. And any time we need to stop or pause in our lives and breathe in God's presence more deeply. Of course, there are formal prayers to help with this. But it doesn't have to always be a formal prayer that we use. Prayer, again, is conversation with God, just as we would talk with a friend. So there is nothing wrong with just saying whatever's on our hearts and our minds. Now, formal prayers can be wonderful in group uh, settings when we are uncomfortable saying what's on our mind, because we're just not sure how it'll sound, if we'll sound eloquently enough. And we can use those formal prayers in a way of doing that. There's wonderful prayers that people have written in the past. We use those in worship. I mean, I use those myself, you know, in, in my own devotional time. Sometimes it's wonderful to read the prayers of someone else that someone else has written when we're at a loss of words ourselves. But when we speak to our closest friends, think about it, we are not usually speaking to our closest friends with prescribed words that we have already determined and written down. And when we speak with our closest friends, we are not trying to get something from them, usually, and we're not trying to convince them of anything, at least in person sometimes. We are never, hopefully, trying to show off to our friends because we know that they love us just as we are. Conversations with friends are how we grow the relationship with that friend and show love. Every time I talk with friends of mine, I don't always know what we'll talk about. I might know the first thing we'll talk about, but quickly that conversation goes in different directions that I and that person never anticipated. Now, I may come to the conversation and say, I want to make sure I, rem I, I remember to tell that person this thing that's going on in my life or, or tell them about this funny story that, about how I ran into someone that they know or something like that. But, but really, even with all of that, I, you know, if I don't get to it all, that's okay, because I really just want to enjoy spending time with them and developing the relationship better. And I look at prayer in the same way. It's how we go grow our relationship with God and how we show love for a God who already loves us and we don't have to show off for and we don't have to convince of anything, and we don't have to feel like we're trying to get something out of God. Now, one of the prayers that a lot of people know and use is the Lord's Prayer. And in worship here at Avery and in many churches, we pray it every week in worship. And, and it's called the Lord's Prayer because it's found here in Matthew 6. as that primary prayer that Jesus teaches his followers. And I think it is such a great easy prayer to memorize. So it's a perfect place to start if you're not familiar or comfortable with this practice of prayer. Just commit to saying this prayer each and every day for three weeks, let's say, to develop a habit of praying. But that's not all there is to prayer, because notice that Jesus never says, pray then these words exactly as I say them. Because then we'd be wondering, well, which translation to use? I mean, the translation I read earlier was not the familiar Lord's Prayer that, that many people here may have learned growing up because it is from a translation that's only about 10 years old. And I, I think that if we had to pray the words exactly as Jesus said then, then all of us would have to learn ancient Greek. That's what the book of Matthew was originally written in. And so Jesus says, pray then in this way, which means he's giving us a perfect example of the content of our prayers. If we're not sure what to pray about in our prayers, then, then God gives us, through Jesus, a wonderful model. You know, there's not just one way to pray, but lots of ways to pray. If you go to our church's YouTube channel, there is a spiritual exercises playlist with lots of different types of prayer and you can experiment with them this week. In fact, I'd encourage you to do that. If you're familiar with mindfulness or meditation already, then some of these ways of praying might feel something like that. 
And if you need something more structured, there are things like the acts method of prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And I have a video describing that. I have a video describing that five finger prayer if you missed the children's moments earlier or if you just want a refresher. But in general, just remember that there are many, many ways to pray, just as there are many, many ways to talk and converse with friends and grow our relationship with friends. But one thing that we need to remember is that in prayer, we are not always the ones that should be doing the talking. Sometimes, and in fact, maybe more often than not, prayer should be a moment of silencing our own thoughts and our own uh, voice so that we can listen for the Lord's voice. So think about this. When you look at the Lord's Prayer, it has roughly 70 to 75 words in the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Depending on the translation, depending on what Bible translation you use, it has roughly 70 to 75 words. And even though the original text didn't have any punctuation, in most of the translations, there are about 11 periods or commas. So if you're praying a prayer of 70 to 75 words with 11 periods or commas, and you're actually paying attention to the punctuation, then you will discover as you read it that there is no way to pray this prayer quickly. I've never heard anyone pray this prayer fast. Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I I've never heard anyone say that because the periods and the commas intentionally slow us down into a measured pace. On average, there's a comma or period about every seven words. So it means that that maybe every time we say seven words to God, we should pause and listen for God to speak at least seven words back. Our prayers should include lots of deep breaths for silence and reflection so that it's God's turn to speak to us and we don't miss what is being said. As Jesus says, prayers with long empty phrases for show doesn't necessarily make our prayers more holy. Kind of like sermons, right? Sermons with long empty phrases for show doesn't necessarily make it more holy. Sometimes, just as with sermons, talking too much in our prayers can put too much importance on what we ourselves are saying and not give enough space for what God is trying to say to us. So I will add just one final instruction on prayer. Make sure you are taking those necessary breaths and pauses with the commas and the periods. Don't be so eager to speak with God that you aren't also giving God room to speak back to you in the commas and the pauses and the periods. And we could go on and on about prayer all day. It is such a, a wide ranging subject with so many different forms and so many different expressions. And so this, of course, is just a Cliff's Notes version of how to pray. But I encourage you to spend this week making prayer a daily habit, just as you'd make time to talk with friends each day or family each day just to check in. Make prayer a time when you check in with God each day, even if just for a few minutes, not just to tell God what's going on with your day, but so that you can listen to God so that God can tell you what's going on with your day in God's mind and with God's heart being at your center. Make prayer something that you explore this week. If you're someone who needs to start or wants to start in that practice of prayer or someone who just has gotten out of the habit of praying or you're just kind of looking for something to, to, to kind of, um, you know, spruce up your prayer life, try one of those videos on our church's uh, Facebook or on our church's uh, YouTube page or, um, or try a different method of prayer that you know or find a prayer book. I have some I can lend out. Make prayer something that you do for your mental and emotional health and for your spiritual health. Because we all need in this noisy, noisy world to just stop 
and breathe deeply and pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we cast all our cares upon you today. We lay all of our burdens down at your feet. Any time that we don't know what to do, we know that we can cast all our cares upon you. We can enter into this moment of prayer at any time and in any place. And in this time of prayer, we can share with you what's on our hearts and on our minds, and yet we can also feel the wind of your spirit filling us up, speaking to us, reminding us to quiet ourselves long enough to listen for you. Lord, it's not hard to notice these days just how much suffering takes place outside of ourselves. And so, Lord, we are in prayer for those who are facing natural disasters occurring or on their way. We're in prayer for, Lord, for those we know who are grieving. For those we know who are in need of healing. Those who are sick with COVID-19. Those who have buried loved ones who have died from it. Those who aren't always seen as fully equal to others around them for one reason or another, because of their race or ethnicity, because of their gender, because of who they love. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful that each one of us is created in your image. And so without the full diversity of humanity, Lord, we don't fully reflect your image. Lord, some of us are well-versed in prayer. We've done it every day of our lives. 
and it has been a wonderful, wonderful aspect of our days. And yet some of us have never actually prayed, which makes today a great time to start. Because it's never too late, Lord, for us to learn or even relearn or maybe unlearn the practices of prayers so that we can more fully learn how you want us to speak to you and, and to listen to you and to find new ways to stop, to pause, take deep breaths, to calm our hearts and our minds and to calm our souls as well with your help. May this week, Lord, be a week where prayer matters in each one of our lives in some way, shape, or form. We offer all these prayers to you, O Lord, and we give you thanks for the ways you continue to speak to us as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A couple of things as we close our worship this morning. I'll remind you that uh, part of worshiping the Lord is offering ourselves and our gifts to God. And some of you have, have offered your gifts in worship to the Lord on your way in today. If you're here with us, uh, some of you may do so as you leave. And uh, if you are watching online, you can always do so securely through our website, averyunitedmethodistchurch.org, all spelled out. And I'll just encourage you to do so, not simply as, as just a habit that you do, but as something that fully offers yourself in worship and praise to the Lord who has given us all things. I also want to let you know that there are, um, I have a few announcements as, as we close, and then I'll give you our benediction. Uh, but I want to let you know a couple of things. First, we were um, hoping that we would be able to consecrate a new prayer station that is going in uh, at the entrance of our uh, of our parking lot. Um, that is still in progress, and it's better to get it done uh, uh, correctly and have it be just as we want it to be rather than uh, do it quickly. So I always say it's better to do things right than to do it quickly. So that's what we're gonna do with that. Um, I am really, really excited to see it when it comes in because I, I don't know quite what it's gonna look like or quite what it's gonna be. Um, but those who are working on it to put that prayer station in, uh, I've been working really hard. And so we will wait for God's time for that prayer station and we will consecrate it, uh, when, it is, uh, when it is installed and appropriate to do so. Uh, I want to just uh, call your attention to a few things as we close. Uh, first is that these beautiful altar flowers are given to the glory of God in memory of Eunice Whitford by the Garda family. Uh, we have online fellowship a um, couple times a week on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We're trying it. We're going to try it for a few more weeks um, and see what the attendance is. And um, so, you know, if, if you if you want to connect with people, uh, it's a wonderful way to do that. And I think especially as we get into these colder months, uh, we're going to want to be doing that a little bit more since we won't be able to get outside as much. Next week is going to be tentatively going to be the last Sunday that will be outside. We still think the weather will be good enough to get us at least one more week out here. And then we're going to uh, we're already in conversations about how to best move inside. And we will um, communicate that to you as soon as we're able to. Uh, throughout the next week or so. Um, call your attention to the, the prayer list. Uh, remember those who are on the prayer concerns list, the shut-ins, um, uh, pray, prayers of celebration for those whose birthdays are this week and anniversaries are this week. And, um, and then there are announcements listed 
And so um, I'll encourage you to do that. And I'll just remind you uh, that in a couple of ways, we are using um, our social media accounts for the church to, uh, to continue through this worship series so that you can worship between the Sundays, as I like to always say it. Um, worship does not just happen once a week, but it happens every day. And so we're trying to give you the tools and the resources to be able to continue in worship throughout your week, as well as connect other people to our worship. So I'll encourage you to do that. All the details about all of that uh, and all the things that I've said and more are in the worship guide for you uh, to read at your leisure. So, um, so take note of all of that. And I'll encourage you to... Uh, to go forth from this place, to remember that the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish each and every one of us. To God be all power and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace and go to pray today and throughout the week.